So recently I sat down for a chat with Desh Amila, founder and CEO of Think Inc. and more recently, This Is 42. Both have and continue to showcase some of the world's most decorated scientists, philosophers, and thinkers. This well-dressed Sri Lankan-born innovator and entrepreneur has hosted and toured the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, Michio Kaku, Sam Harris, and Jane Goodall, just to name a few. We chatted about his journey to Australia and the creation of the brands he now manages, the public appetite for long-form content, as well as the current landscape of social media, artificial intelligence, and the time he met Bill Murray. Desh is an extremely interesting character, and I'm sure we could have talked for way longer if we had access to a large bottle of whiskey and possibly a whiteboard. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Well, thanks for sitting with me today. Well, thank you for inviting me, mate. No problems. Uh, I have a couple of quick fire questions for you. Oh, to start it, off with? To start off with. Oh, right. As uh, some would refer to it as an amuse bouche. Oh, right. Okay. To, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but it would be more amusing to my ears than to my <laughs> mouth. Um, so the, the, I'm going to ask you three at the beginning and three at the end. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, and so the first one would be if the world was ending tomorrow, mm -hmm. what would be your last meal? And, and you can pick anything that you've eaten in the past or maybe something that a family member used to make you or something that you cook yourself. Sure. Um, I'm lactose intolerant, so, <laughs> but I love some uh, food that is made with milk. There is a Sri Lankan dessert called vatalapan. Vatalapan. Yeah, that would be my... I would just have a giant bowl of that. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I want a giant bowl of that now. Okay, cool. Uh, the second question is uh, it's sort of a two-part question. Yeah. What is your favorite virtue and which virtue do you think is most overrated? Oh, wow. That, now you put me on the spot. I'd say my favorite virtue would be honesty as well. I believe it's for many. What is overrated would be also honesty. <laughs> I, I, I say that uh, being cheeky here because um, we have a very black and white understanding of that virtue, um, but in real life, it's not that simple. Um, you know, there are certain times where you have to, when you converse, I mean, philosophers debate about this all the time, you know, is lying at any interval a bad thing? But then, you know, certain philosophers, I believe, can't believe that you shouldn't lie at any case. You know, uh, but then Peter Singer would say, uh, somebody is running away from a mob and they come to your house um, and you help them hide. And then the mob who wants to kill that person asks you, is person that looks like this in your house? Should you lie at that point? I think you should. You know, so that's why I, I, <laughs> I, was, I wasn't trying to be too cheap. No, it's perfect. Yeah, I really like that answer. Yeah. That's great. And also with the lying point, it's kind of there's a delineation between types of lies as Correct. well, because you can be withholding the truth yep. or you can be outright lying for pernicious reasons or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. The last one for these first three is um, who was the first person you remember looking up to when you were growing up? My mom. Um, so I, I, I was born in a small town in, in Sri Lanka and we grew up the first, um, I believe, 10 years of my life um, at an at a, at a even smaller village in, in Sri Lanka. And there was a period of time my dad wasn't around and he was my mom and my sister. And she was there doing everything and I, it didn't even feel that somebody was missing at that point. So, you know, anything, I asked mom. That's great. Um, she's an she's a incredibly strong woman. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about moving here from Sri Lanka and, and um, what that involved. Uh, a series of fortunate uh, accidents led me to um, Australia. I mean, I use the term accidents in the sense of where I come from and what my family history, if you were to consider that, it was highly improbable me coming to Australia. See, even at a young age, I knew that uh, where I was born and raised was not really where I belong. So at grade five, 
I got a scholarship and I went to the big city, Colombo. Um, I was born in a place called uh, Badulla, lived in a place called Pastara. Then I got the scholarship, went to the big city, Colombo. Colombo is the capital of Sri Lanka. And when I was there, I still felt like, you know, my future is going to be outside of Sri Lanka. Now, with my family's financial abilities, the ability to leave Sri Lanka was just, it wasn't on the cards. It's just, you know, financially, it was not feasible. And I still wanted to leave the country. I, I wanted to figure out a way because my passion to date is filmmaking. So I wanted to get into filmmaking. And Sri Lanka had a small industry, but it wasn't big enough for my way of thinking. So uh, our neighbor was India. India has a huge film industry, the world's largest one. So my natural attempt was to get to India. That we could have worked out somehow. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, I'd like to believe fortunately now in retrospect, um, none of the Indian universities got back to me. Uh, uh, I applied. Um, and I remember you know, when I heard that, I was devastated. And this one time I, I was you know, walking around in Colombo uh, and I got to this um, five-star hotel. I was walking down the street, but there was this big sign saying, visit Australia or study in Australia. Very big banner. And I, I thought, that would be nice. So wait, you're, saying, you're saying those signs actually work? <laughs> well, <laughs> for a guy like me yeah. who was just, you know, just the, I wanted to leave, yeah? So it yeah. was like, that's a sign. <laughs> Ta -da. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it was there. <laughs> so I walked into this place and it was, a, you know, some sort of expo. Every Australian university was there, you know, with the table and their little banners and stuff. Now, keeping in mind, I had no, like my family couldn't afford to send me. I knew that. It was just like, you know, right, well, what's going to happen if I sign up a whole bunch of things? So I, I applied for like four or five universities in Australia. I didn't even know which universities I was filling up the form. The first five I put my name down to and I left. Um, a few months later, I got letters from all of them inviting me to Australia. And then I went to my mom and dad and said, hey, can I? And their initial reaction was, they were happy for me, but they just said, you know, we just don't have the money to send you here. We just, we just can't afford it. But I was adamant. I'm like, we, let's figure out a way. Let's figure out a way. Let's figure out a way. So my parents uh, pulled every resource they had, uh, got a bank loan, went to all my relatives. Now, keeping in mind, I was the first to leave the small city. So I've already had a bit of a precedent. So they knew, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm I, I like to leave and do things that are unusual. So my, all my relatives, they all got together, they all pulled the money together um, and did all the things that was necessary and gave me that you know, first shot. I applied and somehow everything worked out. I got the visa, my application got approved um, and then it came down to it and you know, my parents managed to collect enough money to pay for my first semester of university and a one-way ticket uh, to Australia. Uh, and all my relatives got together and they gave me $500 Aussie and dropped me at the airport and said, good luck. And I, you know, I was like, this, yeah, this is great. Yeah, so it I, sounds like a movie. I know, right? <laughs> it, and now in retrospect, in retrospect, when I say it, it sounds like that's yeah. not really what happened in real life, but that's exactly what happened. And for some reason, I picture you as a little kid <laughs> with an Australian flag and you're waving at the airport and $500 in an airport. <laughs> yeah, I was a teenager, you yeah. know, and, and keeping in mind, when I left Sri Lanka, uh, my hurdles were, I did not speak English. I had a relatively decent understanding of the language because I used to watch a lot of English stuff, um, but I couldn't really speak English. Um, and I've never studied in English. So I'm going to know an Australian university and I've never been on a plane in my life. So I got on a plane via Singapore, came to Australia. And you know, the funny story is when I landed, they put me on a bus and they took me to this university campus. Keeping in mind, because I don't know much about any of this, I applied for uh, Melbourne University, uh, Deakin University, the Burwood campus. For two weeks, I was in Geelong. 
which is about an hour and a half away, is a, like a rural place. Yeah. I thought I was in Melbourne. I still had no idea. Oh, because no. No, they put me in the wrong campus and I had no idea. <laughs> So that was that was the beginning of you're my, like this is great. I was like this is unusually sparse. Like, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> literally kangaroos. I'm like, wow, this is exactly what I signed up for. Yeah. <laughs> like this is this is Australia. <laughs> this is Melbourne. This you know, that's uh, great. A lot of room to run around. But uh, then I realized this is not Melbourne. So they corrected and they moved me to Melbourne. So that's my uh, story. That's a great story. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> do you think that that sort of being able to overcome those challenges that you did when immigrating to the country in some way sort of primed you and gave you this entrepreneurial spirit that you have used to then create? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think um, immigrants have this um, uh, uh, rather common story. Like, my story is not unique. There are many of so, uh, stories like mine. See, I came to the country with, with this, you know, lack of understanding of how the country works, the language works. I mean, I, I genuinely thought I, I, I'll be okay with the language thing, but when I came here and everyone started speaking, I had no idea what was going on. At, at a university level, it was just way over my head. It was very difficult. Um, and the, the practical reality is I was on survival mode. Uh, because $500 was barely enough for anything, you know, from university fees are paid, but I had to pay for my, you know, uh, uh, just everything else. I had to look after myself. And from after the first semester, I had to pay for my entire university fees. So that meant from the moment I land, I was on, like, okay, I know I have a limited time before the money runs out, get a job and go. So it forces you to figure out on the go, what to do. I've made a ton of mistakes, but um, the thing about immigrants is there is, I literally got a one-way ticket, so there is no way of, I'm not going back, and I can't afford to, I can't face my people if I went back, so I had to make it work. Now, my story is it took me a very long time, uh, truly, to achieve sort of a, uh, from a financial perspective of some success and, you know, my projects to really uh, take off. It took me 14 years, really, 2014 was when really things started making sense and finally after all these years. So that, you know, immigrant story of there is no turning back. Once you've taken the plunge, you just see it through, which means it forces you to stick to it which a lot of people do, is you start something, if it's too hard, people tend to be like, this is way too hard. And then you give up. It's a natural way of, you know, like you don't really need to really push way beyond the edge. You don't need to because there are fallbacks. But from where I come from and with the opportunities, you know, that were given to me here, there isn't, it wasn't like that. Comfort zone was just, you know, I, I went beyond my comfort zone. Like the first three, four years of uh, Australia, to date, it's the hardest of my entire life, the things I had to go through. Some of them I've, I haven't even told my parents. I didn't want them to know because they would have been devastated. The practical reality of, you know, trying to make it work over here. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's what sort of, you know, that's why I don't sort of, you know, once I set my mind to something... I am sort of single focused and I want to get that done. And it's, it's kind of like, I mean, people sometimes often refer to it as resilience, but I don't think it's resilience as much as it is that, you know, when you're, you're almost carved out by hardship, that, that it, 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 as you said, it takes a while to yeah, get of there. Course. And then you, you, you build a mind frame up where you're like, you feel invincible. You're like, all right, fuck this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I tell people like, once you've fallen to the absolute bottom, you're not scared of that. You don't really care, like, okay, what's going to happen, all right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be almost bankrupt. Great, I've been there, done that. Oh, what's that? What's then, okay? Uh, you're not going to have enough money to buy groceries for the week. Yeah, I've been there, done that, so, so what? Yeah. I think in retrospect, you can use the term resilience. When you're going through that, resilience is the last thing in yeah, your yeah. head. Yeah, feel resilient. <laughs> like, no, no. <Nah. laughs> so tell me about how that... Uh... Well, tell me about how thinking started and then, yeah, sure. and then uh, now what you've got going, which yeah. is This Is 42, yeah. which is a fantastic 
organization. Thank you. So um, I got involved with the Australian events industry um, first in 2005. Um, I, I used to host a radio show in Melbourne. Uh, shout out to Syn FM, uh, SYN, Student Youth Network. Um, I used to uh, partially program manage um, uh, the hip hop night and then later created the R&B night, so Wednesday nights and Saturday nights. Um, so I used to host a few shows, produce a few shows, and because of the shows, I got introduced to the Australian events industry, from nightclubs to music touring, etc. I got to interview some of the biggest names uh, uh, during that time. Um, and with that, I got sort of dragged into this event sector. So I've done everything from organizing nightclub nights, to DJing, to doing touring, to managing, everything that I understand. Um, after a point around, I would say about 2008, 2009, I started getting a little disillusioned with the whole industry because you know, it's, it's a glamorous industry, but once you've been through the whole cir uh, circuit, it feels empty. Mm. You know, um, it's great fun. Mm. Love, you know, back then, used to love to party, but after a certain point, um, you know, I remember, you know, at one of my events, there was like 4,000 people there. Everyone's just going off, it's crazy. It was a successful event. I was looking at the audience and I felt like, wouldn't it be amazing if I could get this many people to listen to like maybe a scientist, because at that point I was really getting into, you know, reading philosophy, reading science. Because so I put, went through from 2005 to about 2008, I went through this personal journey of, you know, learning about the world religions and reading philosophy, etc. So, you know, I had this moment where I had that thought and I was like, you know, what is out there like that? So I realized intellectual events, they did exist primarily in the academic space. So at universities, there were lectures, and then there were big conferences with really high price ticket uh, tags, like, you know, $2,000, you know, Al Gore has been to Australia, and like, oh, this is, you know, that existed. But I realized that doesn't invite a, an average punter like me to go to either of them. I don't want to go to uni. The last place I want to be, so I remember the four or five years I was at uni, you know, I don't want to go back there. And if you're at uni, the last place you want to do, you want to go back to is another lecture hall. You don't want to go there. So, and then I couldn't afford to go to any of the big conferences. So I was thinking about it, um, and then uh, it dawned on me, why don't I create something? So I had an idea in 2010, the idea was a little too ambitious, but in a nutshell, uh, I wanted to create, back then, the biggest music festival in Australia was Big Day Out. So I wanted to create the intellectual Big Day Out. That was my goal. So I created Think Inc. originally as an event, not a brand. So it was meant to be an event. It was an annual event that's going to happen. And my first attempt was you know, to, to invite as many intellectuals I could think of, but mix in comedians, musicians, and make it into an ideas festival. And it did happen. In 2011, I organized the first version of it. Um, the first time ever Neil deGrasse Tyson visited Australia was for that event. I had uh, Michael That's awesome. Sh yeah, there was, so great, it, yeah. It, it, there's funny stories there, but yeah. he's great. I had Michael Shermer. I had the world uh, slam poetry champion, uh, Shane Koizan from Canada. Um, you know, Josh Thomas was the host. Uh, Father Bob from Melbourne was there. Um, a whole heap of people. But the problem was um, that I needed uh, a lot of people to make that work financially. And I had a very low ticket price. It was for this entire day event. It was $99 with all these speakers, full day event. Uh, compared to other events like that, it was really well priced. So I had 1,750 people attend that event, which visually it looked great. You know, and I remember seeing a blog post a few days after saying, you know, we've made a million dollars. Like somebody calculated how many heads were there, calculated the dollar numbers, and like that means they made a million dollars. Uh, but the reality is I actually needed just over 3,000 people to break even. So yeah. we actually lost oh, wow. a ton of money. Yeah. Um, so that was the beginning of thinking. Um, although it was a success, in a way, 
but financially it was a failure. But I knew the idea had legs. So it took me a while. Uh, you know, I moved to Sydney and in 2013 I started working on it again. And I worked extremely hard to make it a reality. Then I turned the actual thinking website that I had, which still kept getting traffic, into a brand itself. And I started posting a few things here and there, got a few people to write, to it, and we used to get a lot of traffic. So then I realized, okay, the way to go is turn thinking into a brand. It's an intellectual brand. And then I relaunched it in 2014 with Dr. Michio Kaku, the co-founder of Super String Theory, as a standalone tour. It was just him. Mm, I remember that. Yeah, yeah this yeah. Uh, it was Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Mm. Uh, we announced it, and within like I remember the first few hours, the, the site kept going down because of the demand. Yeah, you know, Things and I was like, okay, this is working, but I wasn't expecting it to be like that. Um, but and you know, the rest is history, more or less. You know, that show, that tour was sold out, and that gave me what I needed to then run with it. And then, um, and so since then, you've sort of. Uh, moved on, and now you have, yeah, this is yeah. 42, and this um, is kind of a, a slightly different format again, so now everything is... Yeah, so in 2018, I sold the uh, thinking and I moved on. Initially, I, I wanted to create a brand, uh, again, create another brand, but I want it to be beyond events. So the issue with thinking was its ability to scale. You can do so many events, but that's it. After a number of events, because there was a, at a time we were doing like 24 or 30 events a year and it was like constantly touring. Um, that became quite exhausting. Um, but I wanted to create a brand that we could do a bit more. Uh, my initial idea of uh, This Is 42 uh, is to create a event touring company uh, and a talent management agency and also a content production uh, venture. But I realized um, around mid to late last year, I've taken on a little too you, much. You, like, you we like, like doing that, don't Yeah, you? <laughs> I, that's how I generally start. It's sort yeah. of like, you know, in my head, I, I, I learn from sort of doing things. Yeah. So, with This Is 42, we've done a couple of tours. Um, we've created a, a range of podcasts. We've got tons of content online. Um, but as of August last year, I've sort of brought everything together. And uh, behind the scenes, we've completely flipped the script. So we are a few months away from relaunching This Is 42 as a single focused new venture which I'm yet to announce, um, but um, it'll happen in the next month or two. Um, but it would, it would uh, give me the ability to venture into, into the same space, the intellectual space. Uh, see, I ha my whole idea with thinking was to make being intelligent cool. Right? I wanted the cool kids to be talking about uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, while at the same time they're talking about, say, Kanye West. You know, I want them to talk about, uh, you know, Jane Goodall's work. Uh, if they were interested in Kim Kardashian, why not Jane Goodall, right? Um, so that, that line of thinking is what is going to embody the new version of This Is 42. The world has changed since 2010, obviously. So, yeah, later this year I will be launching a new kind of venture um, that will help further my ambition of making being intelligent cool. I do, I also have with, with, with age, I've come to a point, I want people, uh, help people find meaning in life. Um, and encompassing both of them is what will happen with This Is 42. And tell me, you, you just mentioned that um, the world has changed a lot and how people are receiving their information and digesting information these days has changed a lot. Is the new format of this is 42 almost reactionary to that new paradigm shift? Or? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think consciously I did that, but it is. I think uh, everyone, uh, 
compared to back then, uh, social media has fundamentally altered the way we consume content, um, whether it is YouTube or TikTok, whether it is uh, long form publications or Twitter, you know, people consume content differently now. And uh, I do see some of the shortcomings of um, some of the shorter form uh, consumption uh, pub, uh, platforms or distribution platforms. I'm specifically talking about sort of like the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world. Um, Microblogging and stuff yeah, like they, that. Yeah, the, they're very quick and easy scrollable versions where you don't really get the information you want. What I'm trying to create is more towards anyone who wants to have access to a much longer form um, you know, yeah. knowledge I mean, consumption. Because people, are, I mean, it always gets thrown around these days that people have shorter attention spans. But I, I'm not sure that that's true. Um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think you have a point. The, the notion that uh, somehow our attention spans have gone. I, I at one point, where, when I was consuming Twitter a lot, uh, I got worried that, like, have my, either I'm getting old or my attention span has really changed. Um, but I think it's not necessarily the attention span. I think people still want to consume, uh, you know, meaningful content. Uh, and if it is long form, they will. I mean, there are plenty of examples. You have this long form podcast that, you know, like the Joe Rogan podcast goes for three hours. And, you know, there are plenty of other podcasts. You know, Sam Harris's podcast for well over an hour. Um, you have publications that publish very long form articles like Quillette. And people read that stuff, you know. Uh, so... If it is provided, people do consume long-form content. But you can get into bad habits with the short-form content platforms because it's kind of fun because by design, they're made to just give you a little bit, just enough for you to keep staying there. Yeah, they you know? prey on your, your, yeah. most, your worst instincts as a human being. That, of that's kind right. of like, that's that, right. that, that sort of idea that, you know, it's age-old. Uh, saying of if it bleeds, it leads. Right. Um, and you have these, I mean, when you truncate everything to 140 characters and then you have um, news channels that are just trying to get your attention and will say the most brash thing in order to get you to read more. But sometimes you don't read more. You yeah. just read the headline. headline. And then it's, it's hard because when, when, when the platform is geared to the headline, uh, it's hard for someone to go beyond the headline. Like you, n nowadays especially, you know how what is trending, right? And trending, uh, you have the word that you like. Oh, okay, cool. This, this is, I want to know about Trump or Epstein. Click mm. that. Now you have, uh, you know, a thousand headlines. And then you go through all the headlines and you are perceived by this notion, I've read everything now. You haven't read a, a detailed article of anything, but you've read thousand headlines. Now you feel like I know everything about this subject. Matter. Yeah, or, or you're you going know? to approximate the average That's right. between all of those That's things, right. which that is, is insane way to... Yeah, to yeah, yeah. But, but the platforms are designed in that way. And, and, and I remember, I don't remember who we, I was talking to, um, somebody with a far, far better uh, uh, wired brain, uh, scientists actually told me, today's smartest people right now what they're doing is they're behind a computer programming um, how they can keep you on their platform oh, for long. Oh, I've seen this. Yeah, but brain hacking, they call yeah. it. Yeah. Right, so they yeah, yeah. are interested in us staying on the platform because so they can sell more ads to us, mm. which is a kind of a sad reality. Yeah. Isn't the greatest brain power? That's what they do yeah. instead of you know doing something else. But then again, it's a it's a um, it's what the market. The market is made for that, you know, it's... Well, I mean, I guess those people are just tapping into what is natural about our humanity, yeah. right? That kind of leads you down a path of thinking, well, they're just catering to the, to, to the market and the people are the problem. If they, if they want to consume information in this, in this really short and brash fashion in which they don't delve too deeply into things and they get that dopamine hit and then they keep on going, what is the incentive for a platform to provide a different alternative of information consumption? Um, well, the alternative is what's happening right now is quite corrosive, right? Um, for a platform to sustain the long term, um, 
I believe, and I think some platforms are realizing that, for example, when Instagram realized how much damage it's causing with the number of likes being shown, and they made a you know, surprising move of removing that um, because they were linked to the highest number of teen suicides. Um, so when a platform realizes that it is slowly but surely destroying its own user base, it's bad business. And I think perfect example is YouTube. I think YouTube as a social media platform has been doing far better compared to say a Facebook or a Twitter. So the incentive is longevity. Is that because you, you find it's a little bit more self-regulated or how, how do you... Um, with, with YouTube, I think they were forced to self-regulate for two reasons. I mean, they made a very good decision right at the beginning to share revenue with its content creators. Mm. Um, and then when things got toxic in the comment sections, because back in the day I, I remember I used to use, uh, when I say something's toxic, it's like the comment section of YouTube. That, I can't say that anymore because the comment section is a lot more controlled nowadays. I would rather say it's like Twitter because Twitter is now a complete cesspool, just mm. generally when you look at it, mm. just people, you know. But what they did was first they incentivized the content creators um, and that gave the content creators the ability to create quality content for different niches. Um, and then by sharing the revenue, that made creators be more creative and try to, well, I can make a living out of this. No other platform is really doing it that way. Right, and then um, well, not directly at least. No. I guess the in, in, uh, you know the Instagram people are kind of they get their money through third parties yeah. via the app. Yeah. But this is actually a different model because this is the app paying them. Correct. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they're they're basically sharing whatever is advertised on uh, your channel because they are using your content to make money, so they're sharing it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that happened with YouTube is when there was a error was notified, the community rally against it, people rally against it, and they decide they had a, a few rounds of uh, adpocalypse, as they would call it, like a lot of big advertisers post advertising with them that forced them to reconsider how do we uh, you know, fix some of the issues. Like some of the early issues were serious issues, like they had some content automatically or, or people self-labeled as child-friendly, but the content were just just terrible content, you know, and it, they, they shouldn't have never been allowed to uh, do the things that they were doing, uh, showing to children. So that, like, you know, this slowly but surely uh, regulation, and because they created the community of creators, they are more or less forced to listen to the creators and work with the creators. When you have that sort of back and forth interactive nature, for sustainability of the platform, it, the, the, the actual platform is incentivized to do the right thing. But on Twitter and, and, and Facebook, that dynamic doesn't really exist. On Twitter, you are incentivized by exposure. And the algorithm, for example, if you go to Twitter right now, if you look at, uh, say, Donald Trump's, he says something, and then if you look at the comments right under it, it's not the comment with the most likes that is on top. It is one of the most incendiary or more outlandish secondary comment is on top because then it forces you to respond to that. Right. So they, they are right now, they don't incentivize anyone to be reasonable, mm. rather they are incentivizing. You want to be seen? Say something outlandish to this outlandish thing to start off with. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's all a game of getting people to stay on these platforms. That's right. Like, I've heard that they're designed by um, the same types of people who design Get, you know, gaming machines, like slot machines and stuff like well, that. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> even, even I wouldn't have be the, surprised. Even when you pull down Twitter, like a, it's like pulling down... A <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I never thought of it that way, but yeah. I think... It's, I think it's not an accident, to... apparently. Yeah. Uh, like oh, that. absolutely. Nothing that we, we see on any of these apps are an accident. I think there's thought, a serious amount of thought has gone into it to create it the way it is right now. Absolutely. What about, what do you think about the fact that I mean, you're talking quite a lot about YouTube before and how it was a very different environment. I think, you know, that that's very true. At the same time, it's Google, right? True. What do you think about one company that 
owns you? Yeah, I think this is a, this is a very important question. See, I believe, and, and I may be wrong here, but I believe in the early 1900s, um, there was one family that owned uh, the entirety of the oil business. Really? Yeah, there's one family and the government got involved realizing how much power that this might have and they broke up the whole business. Um, so the way I would answer this question is, uh, is it okay for people to be billionaires? Are billionaires okay? And my immediate reaction was absolutely. You know, if they worked hard, that's fine. I didn't think too much of it. And then a few months ago, I saw an article which showed that um, Jeff Bezos trajectory of becoming a trillionaire. And then it dawned on me, a trillion dollars net worth of an individual, an individual. And I, I remember that this is a, a famous uh, economic study, uh, I think early 2000 that was done about what is the dollar amount an average person needs to live their ultimate lavish lifestyle. And the economists sort of whittled it down to uh, $42 million back then. Now, that's not where 42 for my is brand that, comes yeah. in. Uh, it just happened to be. It is not. <laughs> the, the thing is, right, if you were to talk to an average person and say, hey, I'll give you $100 million, right, how would you spend it? And you can do this social experiment. And you can ask, well, and people will generally say they want this fancy house, all right, in, in this area, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you say, okay, cool. And then you work out, all right, that will cost you $10 million. All right, there's your $10 million. And they'll say, I want to buy this car, this car, and this car. Great. That would cost you just under a million. Okay, now you're on to your $11 million. Okay, I want to do this, 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 this. You know, you write everything down. You realize they're barely able to get to 20 or $30 million in a practical sense. People don't know what to do with money. So people don't know how to deal with a hundred million dollars. Well, I mean, a trillion is just, I, I can't, I didn't even know how to imagine that number. That's when right. I, so when I, money, the, like when I got to that point, when I realized, hold on a second, maybe there is a real argument here. Should a individual human being able to have that much wealth? When we, ha you know, wealth disparity is a reality. Now the world has gotten a far better place, mm. but wealth disparity is an absolute reality, right? Uh, I mean, perfect example is, what I am making right now in Australia compared to my mom and dad combined, they're both retirees, uh, they're both school teachers, they used to be school teachers. Their pension combined is under $500 a month, mm. right? It, it doesn't make any sense, right? Mm. That shouldn't be the case. My, my dad was a school principal, right? And they're considered okay yeah. for where I come from. So this wealth disparity around the world, it shouldn't be the way it is. Then you have the potential of one person becoming a trillionaire, which is all coming back to the question you asked is, I think there is a rational argument to break up corporations when they get to a point if people know the sheer amount of information that Google has on you as an individual, mm. it should get everyone thinking, this, this is, this, 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 you, you should be a little bit uncomfortable. We should at least have the conversation. We should <laughs> talk about it. I'm like, uh, I don't know if you know that you, know, you can go to your Google Maps yeah. and look at the you know, last five, six years of every destination you've ever been to. Yeah. You know, what you've got to understand is Google has the most advanced AI on the planet, right? Hollywood told us AI means Terminator, but the reality is AI is already here. The artificial intelligence we were scared of are these metal things that shoot things, right? But in reality, if you look at what certain algorithms are doing, no human engineer is able to work out, you put the information here and the result comes out, what happens in the middle, it is not humanly possible for us to know how the machine got to that conclusion. We've given it some information, it's learned everything else, right? So all of this information about us is teaching various different AI everything about us and the human yeah. condition. And it is now able to predict things about us way better than we can. It knows more about us than we do. You know, sometimes you look at your phone and you'll be like, how is this bit of information in front of my phone? I just thought of it. By a few, just a few actions of yours, 
that yep. go in the Google or with ecosystem. Enough, with enough data points. That's right. I, I'm kind of comforted by the fact that I can be reduced to an algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> There's something I like about it. Sure. I mean, it does make it very easy for us. Yeah. But we haven't thought about, okay, where is this ultimately heading to? This yeah. is what I, I, yeah. I noted when you said we should at least have a conversation. Yeah. And this goes to the heart of your original question. Should one corporation have access to this much information, this much wealth. Mm. I don't know. I think we should talk about it. I and think also sort of just like being able to uh, switch people on and off and, and tell people, I, I, I don't know, it, it seems like a lot of power for what is essentially like a couple of dudes behind a computer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like I have a computer, why don't I have that power? Yeah, but, it, but you're absolutely right. I think, I think there is genuine conversation to be had about this. And I think uh, internet was never made to be centralized and controlled. The whole idea of the internet is its ability that you can create this piece of content and reach many thousands mm. of people, right? Back in the day, that was a privileged few that had that option, right? You had to go to a big TV show or a big network or big publication. Now anyone can do it. But that decentralization is precisely why you can have artificial intelligence become like a, a, a pernicious mechanism without anyone ever intending it to, to become so. Because and, little people, like people work on little bits of information yeah. all around the world without a general sense of let's take over the world. And before you know it, you know, I'm getting uh, dog videos that I didn't ask for. <laughs> You're right. You know I mean, I'm about, right? Uh, no, look, again, I think a fair number of people, uh, a lot smarter than uh, us, are thinking about this. But I think there needs to be a lot more conversation about this, mm. uh, whether it is conversation about breaking co uh, corporations apart uh, uh, or, or conversation about uh, personal wealth. I think if, you know, I think it is a... A real conversation one should have. Once you get a billion dollars, you're good. You, you know, you don't need any more. Yeah. Now we need to figure out how we're going to, uh, you know, what are you going to do with anything else you make? I think that's a genuine conversation one should have. Um, with regards to uh, algorithms curating everything for us, I think, again, we need to be... As a, as a, there needs to be some sort of a global alignment of conversation about, you know, okay, cool, we're doing this with AI. We're doing this with AI. Everyone comes together and we talk about it. Because you only need one bad actor to do the wrong thing. Um, not so long ago. Yeah, everybody I, has to be on the same page. Right, Otherwise, if you don't. Otherwise, it's going to create a competitive environment in which the people who regulate and do the right thing are going to get fucked over. I saw there's, a, there's a, a, an American startup has done the unthinkable, um, and they're already on it. Um, they've created a facial recognition software. What they've done, they've gone ahead and collected, I think, a trillion odd photos, just scrubbed the internet, and fed it to an AI. Um, and no one, like everyone knew this was possible, but nobody wanted to do it because the unethical nature of it. Mm. Uh, I don't want to even name the name of the company. I don't want to give any publicity, but they've done it. This exists now, which means you, have, you can have a simple app, go, walk on the street, point at someone, and the app will tell you everything about that person. That already exists, and they are now trying to sell it uh, you know, to uh, a range of people. Jeez. Imagine the power say a government like the Saudi government will have if they want to figure out, uh, because they have a very strong stance against homosexuality, yeah. they could easily work out uh, which people they want to execute That's a using the simple app. And the makers of this app have had and can, uh, currently are having conversations with the Saudi government with uh, letting the government use this app. So this is what I'm saying. Unless there's a global alliance about, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, what are, what are the human rights, what are the digital human rights mm. we have? Yeah, this is going to end up really bad. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> we always end up talking about things that are going to end up really bad. <laughs> I love chatting with you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this up in a sec, but I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to those general questions. Sure, please. The, the last three that I have. Yeah, sure. Before I get onto that last three, I, I did want to ask you, what was it like be, uh, meeting Bill Murray? Oh, that was the most randomest thing. See, I was there uh, with 
um, Michio Kaku. Yeah. We were doing his biggest ever tour, and he happened to be in the same hotel. I normally I had nothing to do with him, and you know I've I've seen the film. I'm a fan of his work. I know the myth about Bill Murray. So I was just waiting for Professor to come down, and I was like, Bill Murray. <laughs> What, what is happening? And I've never gone up to uh, a star because of the industry I worked in and say, hey, can I take a selfie with you? And I just but went up Bill to him Murray. and said, it's Bill Murray. You have to <laughs> you do have it. To. Right? I went up to say, I'm really sorry. I know you're trying to go get some breakfast, yeah. but can I please take a photo with you? And he was just like, yeah, yeah. And That's I was amazing. Like, yeah, it's great. That's it. I wish I had a better story with Bill That's Murray. That's a great story. <laughs> I, I, well, it was, it's better than if you had, oh, yeah, I was touring him or something yeah. like that. <laughs> would have been shit out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, fine. No, there was yeah. one time I, I was like quite starstruck. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, Murray, randomly. Cool. The hotel lobby. All right, so let, let's wrap this up with a few. If you had to change professions, mm -hmm. uh, you could do anything you wanted, regardless of qualifications. It would just magically happen tomorrow. What would it be? This is going to sound pre pretentious. I wouldn't change anything. What if you had to? If I had to, if somebody yeah. forced me, but then again, what what is it that I do? Like, you know, what, like, I do some business stuff. I do some management stuff. I make films. I do podcasts. I don't know. Why would I? I love what I do. Um, okay, if that's the case, I would drive race cars. You drive race cars. I would drive race cars. Any particular type of race car? Uh, probably. I I can't take that many Gs, so it wouldn't be Formula One. But Formula uh, Two. Right. Mm, I would probably be a rally car. thing? That was just a joke. I don't uh, know what oh, right. <laughs> I, no, there, there is. There are different levels of you oh, know, Formula really? E. You know. Jokes no, on I'll, me. I'll, yeah, jokes yeah. on me. I would drive rally cars. Okay, rally, rally cars. cars yeah. uh, if you had to live in another country other than the one that you do, where would it be and why? Uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah, uh, I, I visited that place. You know when you have an idea about a country and then you go there and it's like, Oh, this is nothing like what I thought it was. I remember happening, that, that happening when I went to England, when I went to America, all the countries I've been to, even Canada. But I went to New Zealand and I was like, wow, this is everything I thought and even better. And I'm talking about just the nature and the fact yeah. that that place is, you know, if, the term heaven on earth is used, but my God, New Zealand yeah. is just a stunning, stunning place. Belinda Carlisle, big fan. Yeah. Uh, if you had to spend a day with the cl a clone of yourself, what would be the most annoying aspect of your clone? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the last interview I'm ever going to do. <laughs> You're never going to come back. No, no, these are rather interesting. These are interesting thought experiments that, that popped into your head. So it, it tells a lot about you than about me, I think. Uh, if the most anno so you're basically asking what's the most annoying trait of me. What do you really? think is the, is the most annoying thing about you, but, but if you had to hang out with you? So, so, so not something that you find annoying about yourself that you might internalise mm. subjectively, but if you were to hang out with yourself or a version of yourself, what do you think you'd find annoying? Um, it depends on what stage of the clone, like if the, uh, the clone that is my age, which is unlikely, so it'll have to be a younger me, which means uh, <laughs> I already take a very long time to get to a point. Yeah. I would have taken a lot longer. So just that trying to have a normal conversation yeah. would be quite frustrating. Okay. Because I would take a very long time to get to my point, <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't noticed. <laughs> I like that though, it works for this. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> well, Desh, thank you very much Mate, for chatting thank you. today. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you.